Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our inaugural NSCAA TV broadcast. The development and debut of NSCAA.com, NSCAA TV.com, is a wonderful new chapter for our organization. Not only does it provide a dedicated outlet for coaches, student athletes, parents, and fans that enjoy live soccer coverage, but it also extends the reach of our association and the range of services we can provide. Thank you to Quick Goal for sponsoring tonight's keynote session. Quick Goal is a very important partner with the NSCAA. And if you don't have a piece of Quick Goal equipment on your field or in your backyard, you probably should. Following the session, we will have a short question and answer time period with our keynote speaker. You can send in questions via Twitter to at NSCAA using the hashtag NSCAASS. The responsibility of someone when introducing a keynote speaker is to tell you a little bit about that person. I suspect that this audience doesn't need me to tell you about Alexi Lalas. You can find all those details if you did a quick search. But what I have the ability to do this evening is to go beyond telling you something about the soccer guy and tell you something about the person. I'm going to hit the Wayback Machine to 1996, the launch of Major League Soccer. I was fortunate enough at that point to be the Assistant General Manager for the New England Revolution. In the launch of the league in 1996, each of the MLS teams was given two allocated players. Mike Burns from Marlboro, Massachusetts was one of our national team players and Alexi was the second. For those of you that know a little bit about the history of, that, of this league, you will recognize that he was the poster child for MLS. No matter what anyone may say about where this league is right now, we all owe a debt of gratitude to what Alexi gave to us in those early years. What does that mean? Let me capture a day in his life while a player for the New England Revolution. We're at the old Foxborough Stadium, not the beautiful Gillette Stadium you see right now. Foxborough Stadium, you, your cars were parked way above the stadium and you had this hill that you'd walk down onto the field. So after training, it was a little bit difficult after training to get back up into the locker room, especially if you had gone through a tough training session. Training session ended, and one of my responsibilities was, was to make sure that wherever Alexi was supposed to be, he got there on time, because his time was always committed to something. I was standing at the edge of the field, and as he came off, I reminded him that there were some children waiting for him in the locker room. The children were between the ages of 8 and 12, and they were from a pediatric care unit in Norwood Hospital. I watched a transformation as the player, Alexi Lalas, now became someone who was going to give an opportunity to a child to meet a hero. Alexi walked into the locker room and switched on to being the Alexi Lalas that so many people have met him come to know. For a long period of time, those children were treated to whatever they wanted. Whether it was t-shirts, autographs, pictures, it didn't matter. There he was in full view for these children, giving them a memory that would last their lifetime. I'm standing off at the corner, continuing to remind him that he has another appointment. The next appointment involved a quick change into a suit coat and tie and a trip into Boston to present to a sponsor for the New England Revolution or a national campaign. So he had gone from player to meeting some children, 
but he would not sacrifice the opportunity to spend time with those children. When they were done, then he would move on to becoming a corporate spokesperson. Shower, change, suit coat and tie, sprint up that hill into the town car and off to Boston he would go. I know we're late and we're very late for this presentation. He jumps in the back of the car, the car goes about 15 feet forward and instantly stops. I said, oh, what's wrong? He's really late. What's going to happen now? I run up to the car, window comes down. He says, you know, Joe, I'm really late for this sponsorship presentation. It was with one of the major banks. I said, I know, Alexi. He said, I, no, I'm really late. I said, I know, Alexi. He said, I'm going to tell them it's your fault. He laughed that laugh that we all see now when we see him on ESPN. But off they went. Every day was like that for this man. Every single day. You walk out the door, someone wanted a picture and an autograph. I'll close by telling you, in all the years that I spent with him, never once, not a single time, did he disappoint us in what we asked of him. This league, with the announcement yesterday of four more teams over the next three or four years, this league is indebted to this person. You can find out about his soccer, do all the research. This league is indebted to this person for what he has given to our sport. Ladies and gentlemen, our keynote speaker, Alexi Lalas. Hold on, everybody smile. Everybody smile. All right, cool. That was just about the nicest intro I've ever gotten. I appreciate the fact that you mentioned that I showered. Uh oh. Just so you know, symposium, if you spell it wrong, in Blackberry, it comes up as syphilis. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. So a couple of days ago, I was um, standing on a stage at a Macklemore concert. Anybody know what that is? Because I didn't. But we had a good time. And it looked very, very different than it does right now. Um, I thought a lot about what I was going to talk about here, and uh, I'm not wearing makeup, and I don't have lighting, uh, and that's fine by me, because uh, I wanted to talk about some different stuff when it comes to development. Because, is my water here? Yeah. I talk about soccer for a living. I talk about soccer players, and I talk about coaches, and teams, and fans, and media, and business, and pretty much anything that affects the game that we all know and love. If there is a debate to be had about soccer, I usually have an opinion. It's what I do, and it's what I love to do. However, not everybody always agrees with me. As a matter of fact, lots of people disagree with me. It'll happen tonight, I guarantee it. I accept that, I value that, and I do encourage that. It makes things a whole lot less boring. So, I've been part of American soccer, as Joe was saying, for, oh gosh, over 30 years in one way or another. I've played for coaches who read soccer for dummies on the sideline to understand the rules, to international legends who spend hours dissecting the minutia of the advantages of a back three to a back four. I've hired coaches. I have fired coaches. I have loved coaches, and I have absolutely despised coaches. I have criticized coaches, and I have praised coaches, at least one that I know about. In one way or another, though, coaches have impacted my life since I was six years old. But what I have never done is be a coach, at least not the extent that all of you have. You all have much more experience uh, than I do. So what I'm about to talk about tonight is simply based on my time in the game. It's based on my experiences. Some of them are unique and some of them are universal. 
It's about what I've seen. It's about what I see. It's about what I believe. But it's also bound to be flawed. It's bound to be incomplete. But ultimately, I do believe that it's valid in that it is simply an opinion on one aspect of this massive Rubik's Cube that we call development. One opinion of many, including yours. You can choose to agree or disagree or ignore my position. But regardless, know that you as coaches still remain the key. You have the ability to affect change. You will ultimately determine how quickly or successfully we're able to develop players because you will be the coach who talks to that six-year-old just starting out or that academy player who is on the verge of breaking through or that senior player who is fending off competition from an incoming freshman or that rookie making his first professional start or that U.S. legend getting ready to take the field for, fingers crossed, a semifinal of a World Cup. And so regardless of, of what I say tonight, for that you will have my eternal respect and gratitude. All right, so in thinking of what I was going to talk about and talking about development, I said, you know, I got, a, I got a phone. It's got a lot of numbers in it. Let me call some people that I trust and respect and find out some things about what they think. Because sometimes you just sit alone in your room and you think about stuff, and being able to talk and have conversations and debate is important. So I called some friends of mine and asked them what they thought. What first came to mind when they thought about the problems and what are some of the hindrances that we have with regards to developing soccer in the United States? One of them said immediately, technical ability. We don't have enough coaches who understand attention to detail, to technical detail at a young age. They focus on winning and losing at such a young age. Talked about really good athletes that are simply left to their own devices and they don't understand why proper technique is important. That was Peter Vermes, head coach of Sporting Kansas City and the coach last night against Roma for the MLS All-Stars. I talked to another young man who said, too many different environments with completely different priorities. Kids need the same environment for a long period. He said, our country is so big that everyone sees things in a different way. That was Peter Vallenas, the director of the LA Galaxy Academy. I talked to another guy that I respect a lot. He said, number one, environment. Good players aren't challenged. The best players flourish simply because it's easier. They're not stimulated. They lose hunger. They become entitled. That's Caleb Porter, who not only is having success at the professional level, but many of you know has had incredible success at the collegiate level. And I think he'll continue to have incredible success for a long period to come. I talked to a man who said, parents are not letting their kids fail. When, when they finally do, they have absolutely no idea how to deal with it. And specifically, he said, for boys, fear of failure results in lack of effort, so there's no excuse for not succeeding. That was Dan Kalishman, who was coached both at the collegiate level and at the youth level, recently with Chivas USA. He's having a little problem right now, but uh, I digress. Talked to somebody else who I had no idea who it was, but someone told me it was very important, who said, coaches are more concerned with winning than development of their players. In the end, it's a business, and clubs and parents have invested a lot of money. That was Mia Hamm. Someone told me she used to play. I talked to someone who said, it's got to come through MLS. Everything has to flow through the teams. Professional clubs need to be the top of the pyramid. That's Garth Lagaway, GM of Real Salt Lake. And finally, I talked to someone who said, it's coaches. It's you guys. It's all the coaches out there. He said, you find teams bunkering in or playing overly direct at under 14 and 15 level. The coaches only teach for the day and not for the future. They need to win to keep their high paying jobs and to feed their own ego. It's a guy named Mark Connolly, who's the technical director of FC Stars in Massachusetts and coach, coaches used for a long time. So, Got a lot of answers. We all agreed that there were problems. Not necessarily everybody agreed on which is the biggest problem, but we all agreed that there were problems. A lot of different answers from people. What I'd like to call this part is the melting pot fallacy. For years, we've looked at America as 
the melting pot, a beautiful and complex mixture of people and ideas and language and culture. And this descriptive phrase has become ubiquitous in politics and media and business and education, also sports. We're a country of immigrants. I'm Greek. You look at me, you say, that guy's Greek, obviously. Six foot four, redhead. Every Greek looks like me, but I am. We go out of our way to celebrate our, vis our vast differences, and we look at them as strengths that enable us to think more progressively and become more successful. We're a country that has made it a priority to be inclusive, to integrate different styles and cultures and ideologies into one that is representative of the diversity that we championship. Give us your huddled masses, even your redheads. It's not without difficulties or challenges, and it's not perfect. But it is who we are, and it's how we choose to function. Of this, I have absolutely no doubt, and I believe it's what makes us great. But what works for a country may not necessarily work for a sport or a team. Therefore, I submit to you that operating under the melting pot theory when it comes to our soccer development is both a hindrance and ultimately a fool's errand. Instead, we need to operate under what I'll call for our purposes, our purposes here as the water pot theory. I believe in order to truly develop successful players and successful teams, even from an early age, we need to stop forcing the system to adapt to the player and start forcing the player to adapt to the system. And in order to do this, you got to be able to articulate and clearly define what your system is and then be committed to only inputting the talent that fits and embraces your established criteria. There should be no confusion as to the expectations and the abilities required by players in this system. Each position and the way that the position is played can be defined, along with the training that's best preparing the player to carry out the objectives. However, if we do this, we also got to be ready to recognize that, and more importantly accept, the reality that players of undeniable talent will be left by the wayside. That's scary. That concept of unrealized or dismissed talent is a scary one for American soccer to fathom. The fear of wasting talent permeates every level of our game, and I'm sure it's woken many of you up in the middle of the night. Despite our size and numbers, we found that great American soccer players just traditionally do not grow on trees. So when we feel that one has emerged, we bow down and we thank the soccer gods for that gift that they've bestowed on us. And then we bend over backwards to make sure that every opportunity is given to realize that talent. And we continue to do so even when it fails. That's why there's such consternation right now in the U.S. soccer community at the thought of a U.S. national team possibly leaving out Landon Donovan. But what if we had a system where Landon Donovan could arguably be the greatest American soccer player playing and still not fit into the national team? What if within Jurgen Klinsmann's established, defined, and articulated style, he feels that Landon Donovan just doesn't meet his criteria and is unable to adapt and therefore unusable? Perish the thought, right? And immediately, it must be something we, and when I say we, I really mean you, as coaches, are doing wrong. It must be a flawed system that could somehow fail to incorporate such a talent. I'm just using Landon Donovan as an example. Could be many other players. Therefore, what do we have to do? Well, we have to find a way to fit what may be a square peg into a round hole. And boy, do we love to do that. Of course, in the past, there have been talented players that, not for lack of opportunity, have sadly not lived up to what we may have perceived as their potential. And over time, they faded away, or they simply became irrelevant. Their talent is often looked upon as having been wasted. But I would argue that maybe what was really wasted was the time, the effort, the resources spent on trying to fit them in that could more efficiently serve other players. The water pot theory would entail coaches having the fortitude and the confidence to leave out young Johnny X, let's call him, who may be universally viewed as the best young player in the country or the best young player on the block because he doesn't fit into the system that you as a coach are employing. Can you take that heat? Do you believe in your system enough to make that call? Can you afford to sacrifice the potential wins 
the notoriety or the employment opportunities that could come with having Johnny X on your team? I don't know, only you can answer that. But I believe that if you answer yes, that this type of unequivocal approach will actually lead to a more efficient, practical, manageable, sustainable, and yes, a more successful path to development of soccer players and teams. Let me ask you, if your child's educational development was being hampered by a student who after several months was simply unwilling to participate with the class, thus forcing the teacher to continually spend vast amounts of resources and time dealing with him, would you accept it? Or conversely, if your child's educational development was being hampered by a student who was so advanced that he or she continually monopolized the discussion, often about things that didn't even pertain to the subject matter, and limited other students' ability to problem solve or acquire skills to be successful, would you accept it? Both examples hurt the progress of the rest of the group because we're forcing things to fit while on their own or within a group or a different group, they may be of value. But within this particular group, not only do they not fit, but they are actually counterproductive. And yet when it comes to our soccer development, we routinely waste valuable time and resources either attempting to forcefully fit certain players into an existing system or changing a system to find a way to accommodate certain players. Now, before anybody goes and accuses me of being exclusionary with my water pot theory, let me be clear. The system and the style that you choose for your team to play is completely up to you. It'll be shaped by your experiences and your background, and the market will dictate if it's successful. It's no more exclusionary than if you told a worker that in order to do a job, he or she had to uh, adhere to a dress code. And while that employee may be able to carry out the task in his or her pajamas, the effect of doing so would be disruptive and create additional problems that would be detrimental to the overall success of the group. The person would either have to adapt to doing the task in the established dress code or go find another job that enables him or her to work without a dress code. Also, what I'm proposing has absolutely nothing to do with stifling creativity or taking the wonderful component of individual expression out of the game. On the contrary, it can actually give, quote unquote, special players the platform to live up to their talent. But it requires you to define your special players. And it may even require you to re-examine and redefine what you consider to be a special player in the context of your style of play. It is a beautiful game, but the beauty is always in the eye of the beholder. And I do not want a team full of robots that carry out pre-programmed responses. But I also do not want a team full of humans that wing it. So let's talk about size. I often get told that it doesn't matter. The size of the United States is both one of our greatest assets and one of our greatest hindrances. We have millions of young boys, girls, men, women playing the game. And if you believe some, untold and undiscovered riches lie waiting. I believe that if the United States was one divided in, once divided into, let's say, six different countries, some of those national teams would be stronger than the current full team. The shared experiences, the established relationships, similar geography, all would lead to a common and familiar identity that would benefit the team. It would make identification of the talent, fostering of that talent, and implementation of that talent easier. The very lack of diversity that we work so hard to guard against in our current form of development would actually prove an asset in this hypothetical scenario. Yes, I hate to break it to you. Size does matter. And in the water pot theory, players will be required to adapt. They must be able to integrate and maintain their innate abilities while developing required attributes to survive within the environment they encounter. Make no mistake, this is an actual skill. It's as important as trapping the ball. Now, I'm not saying anything new. You can call it whatever you like, but the fact is that this concept is discussed in every sport, every day. The collection of the best players did not necessarily make for the best team. But understanding what your style is, is as important as anything. And to do that, I'm gonna need a couple of volunteers. So, who wants to come up here and be on uh, camera? Let me pull this over here. Anybody, raise your hands. Don't be... Everybody see this? Back in the red. One more, one more. Anybody over here? Green? Okay. 
Come on up. Come on up. Don't be shy. I'm wireless. I'm all over the place here. Okay. What's your name? Alan. Alan. How are you, Alan? You're going to be green. Okay. Alan, you're defending this goal, okay? Your right back has the ball right there. In green, put the other 10 players where ideally you would like them in this situation. Remember, you're going that way. Just 10 players, I don't care. You can play them all in goal if you want. You gotta have 11, I mean, right. I gave you one guy there with the thing. Yeah. I can't do this for you, Alan, I mean. <laughs> Put the pressure on me, aren't you? Nobody's watching this, don't worry. You're, 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 you're done? Yeah, I think so. You can't play with 12, Alan. Okay. You, you're playing with a goalkeeper, right? Yeah. Okay, just checking. All right, you're up. Let me see you put your 11 in. Ideally, where would you like them if the ball's there on the right-hand side? You're going the same way as him. If you're in red, put it put wherever you want. Put the other players. Yep. We've come to consensus. They're both going to play with uh, a goalkeeper. What's your name, by the way? My name is Bill. All right, Bill. What do you think, Alan? He's already in, oh my lord. You got it? Okay. What's your name? Alberto. Alberto. You do the same thing. There we go. The ball's right there. It's a lot of colors. It's a pretty tree. Okay. Where do you coach? Where, where do I coach? In uh, Georgia. In Georgia. Where do you coach? Claremont. And where do you coach? YouTube. Oh, YouTube. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, you guys can go sit down. Thank you very much for your help. Don't, 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 you can't steal these. These are, I gotta give these things back. All right, so, we put the ball here in what could be our right back, and we said, put your team where you want them. The only thing that we pretty much agreed on is that we're going to play with a goalkeeper. And that's okay. Everybody has different ideas about where they want their team to play, where they want their players to set up in every, in every given moment. But the reality is, in any given moment, we can pick three people out of a room with various backgrounds, and they will give us three completely different ideas. How many people, raise your hand, as coaches, like to play with one forward, one striker? How many people like to play with two strikers? How many people like to play with three strikers? Wow, okay. How many people like to play with left-footed players, left-footed midfielders out wide on the right-hand side? How many like, people like to play with a right-footed midfielder on the right-hand side in the wing? Yeah. My point is, that being able to define your style is crucial. In 1994, back in the 1900s, for many of you, I was part of the uh, World Cup. It changed my life. It's one of the reasons why I'm standing on this stage today. Uh, I lived the power of what a World Cup can do to an individual. We trained for two years leading up to the World Cup. Our coach then was Bora Milutinovic. He was crazy, I thought. He ended up being crazy like a fox. For two years, we trained twice a day. We would come into a room, an easel. We would do the exact same thing that we just did there. And the exact same thing happened. He would come in, 
He would say, the ball is there. What do you want to have happen? Where do you want your players around you? And everybody had different ideas. By the time the World Cup rolled around in the summer of 1994, we would walk into the room, we would put the ball somewhere, along, somewhere around the field, and every single player on that team knew where the other 10 players were to be in that moment. It took a long time to figure that out. But that was our style. That was what we learned. That's what we developed. So let's look a little bit more into what is a style of play. We love to talk about it, but we rarely are able to define it, other than in broad terms like possession-oriented, long ball, counterattack. Is it based on the formation you play? 4-4-2, 4-3-3, 3-5-2? Is it based on diamond midfield, zonal, man-to-man, -man, false nine? Is it rooted in some big picture mission statement or ethos? More than a club for the people, the hardest working team, America's super club. Or is it simply dictated by the players you have? Give it to Messi, give it to Neymar, give it to Maradona, give it to Johnny X, who we talked about earlier. And the rest is gonna fall into place. In any game, players in every position are faced with hundreds of situations where they're required to make decisions. There will always be several options available to choose from. So, we can usually collectively agree on what the good ones are, and some we can agree are bad. But many actually fall right in the middle, and it's in this middle that I believe your style of play lives. When faced with a decision, the players ultimately choose what they feel is the best option based on a combination of their instruction married with their innate sensibilities. That decision is the tactical part of the equation. The ability to successfully execute on that decision is the technical part. But when an observer can come to anticipate those decisions, the ones that are not clearly good or bad, and then start to string multiple decisions together, to me, that is a style. But you as coaches implement that style. So who defines your style of play? Obviously, it depends a lot on your situation and the resources that you have available. Ideally, there's someone actually over the coach. Call it whatever you like. Technical director, director of soccer, grand pooba of soccer. It really doesn't matter to me. But he or she must be able, more than anyone else in the organization, to set out the expectations. This person has to already have contemplated the scenarios and the patterns that play out in a game and decided what the preferred option is and how to achieve it. He or she would be able to walk up to the board like we just did and without hesitation place that back four and the rest of the players where they should be ideally in any scenario and list the options for the player on the ball as it relates to the established style. Ideally, he or she must hire the coaches that will be able to work within this system. Everybody loves to talk about vertical integration but nobody wants to truly apply it. You're not hiring the best coach. You're now hiring the best coach for the style of your team, and that is two different things. You're hiring someone who knows the expectations and the parameters. Now, I can't tell you if your style of play is the right one. It depends on your definition of success. Is it winning? Is it popularity? Is it revenue? Is it producing all Americans? Is it producing pros? Or is it simply producing good young people? Maybe it's a combination of all of those. So how does my water pot theory help the U.S. win the World Cup or help you produce a bunch of collegiate American messies or help a youth club become the place where everybody wants to play? It simply hedges your bets. Rather than running around and trying to be everything to everyone, it forces you to simply try to be the best at what you want to be. Let the players adapt to you. They can and they will. And when they do, you will be able to provide them with a level of direction and confidence that will benefit them. They will learn a system and place within it. And they will be specialized and they will be valuable to others who share your style. They will develop tools that will serve them regardless of whether they go on to play in a World Cup or a pickup game. Now, I recognize what I've just laid out is pretty idealistic. It's theoretical. You guys have to go back to the real coaching world. Every point I've made has an equal or valid counterpoint. 
There are a hundred other topics related to development, specific and big picture, that we could talk about for hours on end. I am not naive. There is no panacea. Development is inherently a process, and everybody wants to speed up that process. You're going to go back to your teams, and you will be faced with realities of your particular situation, many that have little to do with kicking the ball. But I hope that you're thinking about how you're going about your coaching. I hope you're thinking about what you want your team or your club or your high school or your college to be. I hope you're thinking about what success is to you. And I hope you have the conviction to remain true to whatever path you do choose. Because if you do that, I believe that you can develop better players and better teams. And finally, we as this American soccer family, we love to kick ourselves for what we haven't done. But we also have to pat ourselves on the back for what we have done. The growth of this game on and off the field is unprecedented when it comes to putting it up against other sports. We live in a soccer nation. We live in a soccer culture. And it's because of this that we're constantly searching for ways to improve. So I thank you as coaches for being a crucial part of this process. And I thank you for being part of the soccer family. And now I will take some questions. All right, Alexi, we've got, a, we've got a few for you. Some are softballs, some really? not, not so much. These are coming from Twitter? They are. Oh, great. They are. Thoughts of Wayne Rooney. It's like a dream boat because it's, the, the guy's gorgeous. Even before the hair uh, thing, he was gorgeous. I mean, in like a rugged kind of way. Um, Wayne Rooney. I still think that he is the only world-class player that England has at its disposal right now. I would love to see him play someplace else. Uh, I think it's very, very difficult for uh, English players in general to travel, uh, and they don't do well outside of England. And I think especially Wayne Rooney would struggle outside of uh, England, but I think that he possesses all the abilities. I think his time at Manchester United uh, has come in order, to, in order to leave. He's done incredible things. Um, but I would love to see him in a different uniform to see how it may or may not ignite something in him um, that sometimes players just need a, a change of scenery. And yes, all of these are coming via Twitter. That was from CSC Blue 94 uh, Second one from P. Gucci, I guess, G-U-T-S-C-H-E. What are your thoughts on the performance of our back four in the Gold Cup? The Gold Cup was wonderful for, for a couple of reasons. It gave uh, a whole different uh, group an opportunity not just to play and to play well, but to win. And that's very, very important. Um, getting to a final of a Gold Cup is, is, to be quite honest, not anything special for the U.S. It's happened many, many times. Winning a Gold Cup it's not that special. We've done it before. Uh, but I think when it comes to the back four, to see uh, players like Goodson uh, and to see a different combination than the Omar Gonzalez, Matt Beasler one that has worked so well over the last few months is important. The only player that I see coming out of this Gold Cup who potentially has a case, uh, and a very, very good case, to go into the starting 11 is obviously Landon Donovan. I don't think that there's anybody that came out of this Gold Cup then you can say, well, he's got to be put in the, in the starting 11 to figure it out. And by the way, figuring out where Landon Donovan goes in that starting 11 uh, is going to be very, very interesting to see what uh, Jurgen Kl uh, Klinsmann does. From Barker, NSCAA, I'm interested in how big or small the playing level jump was for you moving from the U.S. to Syria. A. I, I changed as a soccer player and as a person uh, with the opportunity to go to Serie A. But people have to understand that Serie A back in the, uh, in the 80s and the 90s was very, very different than it is right now. It was before the Bosman ruling. It was before everything opened up. It was before the migration to the EPL. It was the place where all the money was, all the best players. Every single Sunday, I was being challenged. I was playing for a very small team called Padova, which had just come up into Serie A. 
and it meant that every Sunday I was marking the best players in the world. And you can't help but get better. I got my ass kicked a whole lot. Every single Sunday I was playing against world-class players. Um, as far as the, the change, what some people don't realize is in the summer of 94 when I played in the World Cup, I stepped on the field in my first World Cup game and I had never been part of a club situation. I had never signed for a club, I had never been uh, in a club situation professionally. We trained as a national team for the year and a half to the two years before the World Cup. So I had never been in another city living and working as a player. Uh, and it was a big change. And not only was it a change uh, on the field, but off the field, to adjust to a completely different culture where soccer is king, to live in that fishbowl, to learn a new language, uh, to adjust to a new culture, all of those different things, and then every Sunday to have to perform. I certainly became a better soccer player from the experience, but I also became a better person for having to go through those different things. Uh, right now we have a, of a player in Michael Bradley, and people are asking me about it because we have both played in Italy. Michael Bradley is ten times the player than I ever, ever was. His ability right now has made him so valuable, I think, that it's no longer about Michael Bradley being a good American player. He's just a good player in Serie A that happens to be American. And he's very, very important going forward. I couldn't be happy, uh, happier for him to see his development. Uh, and I'm glad that after, geez, whatever it was, 20 years almost of scorched earth after I was there, that finally they opened it up and, and they let another guy come in there. And they didn't just let another guy, they let a wonderful, wonderful player in there that I think is going to uh, continue to do great things for club and country. Okay, let's go to... You guys aren't tweeting there and then it's showing up there, are you? Because that's, that's kind of ridiculous. John Denham. If Alexi were in a city with a population less than a million, mm -hmm. would you move to get your son or daughter the best youth coaching available, or would you seek out that opportunity in the city that you were living in? Oh, no, I'd, I'd do whatever I possibly could for my children to get them the best of, uh, of everything. Uh, I think that, you know, people come up to me all the time and say, you know, what should I do for my kid? How should I, you know, progress? He really wants to play soccer. The first thing I tell them is don't let them be the best player on the team. If they are, find another team, find a better team so that they're not the best player on the team. Secondly, we talk a lot about coaching, uh, and there are various levels of coaching. And just like anything else, uh, if you want to get better, if you want to improve, you have to seek it out sometimes. And that goes for doctors, goes for anything, goes for teachers. You want the best for your kids, and you want to give them the opportunities. So that's a long way of saying, I would do whatever it took if they really wanted to do it and they were serious about the development to get them the best possible coaching. Because without a doubt, there's great coaching out there, Without a doubt, there's horrible coaching out there. Okay. Jay Cooper, 1064. Landon Donovan or Graham Zussi, or why not both on the field for our World Cup team? Landon Donovan is better at going forward, and Graham Zussi is better defensively. Um, so we could morph them. It would be, it would, it'd be ugly, but... <laughs> I mean, aesthetically, it'd be ugly. And I love you. If you guys are listening, Graham and, and, and Landon, I love you. But it would be ugly, let's be honest. Uh, it, would be, it would be fun to see, and it, I think we are going to see at a certain point, both of them on the field together. I was with Graham Zuzzi over this last week, and it was interesting because I watched the Gold Cup final with him. We were at an appearance, and they were showing it. And to watch him watch this team that he has become such a huge part of, and not only to watch the team, but also to watch the team in the context of Landon Donovan kicking ass with that team. Because a lot of people are doing the compare and contrast between the two. They're, they're, very, they're very different types of players, but I understand why, why it's being done. And if Landon Donovan, and when Landon Donovan comes back to the national team, how he fits in and where he does on the field is going to be interesting. Do you play him out on the left, and then do you play Graham Zuzzi out on the right? Uh, you play Landon, Landon Donovan up top. But any time you put him in, you're going to have to bring somebody out. And who comes out? And so it's going to be fun. It's a great situation for Jurgen Klinsmann to have. It's a great situation for any coach to have. Um, but to watch 
Graham Zuzi and to see the wheels spinning as he's watching this team win the gold, do the celebration, have the trophy, um, it was fascinating because I know that Graham Zuzi, he doesn't talk a lot, but he is very, very committed uh, to the future and he has great aspirations to play for the national team and to play overseas. But this is going to throw something at him that he has not experienced. It's all been great, it's all been wonderful. But even if Landon Donovan isn't necessarily coming back and playing his position, this compare and contrast that's going on externally is going to affect him. And I want to see how he responds. If Graham Zuzi is the next best thing, then he responds and he says, you know what? I don't care if you are Landon Donovan. You're not taking my spot. You want to go over there and play on the left? Fine. But this one out here on the right is mine. And you can pry it from my cold, dead hands. He won't really say it like that. But, but that's really what what you want from him. That's what Jurgen Klinsmann wants from him. I'll be disappointed if Graham Zuzi becomes a shrinking violet and lets this affect him. I hope it riles him up and I hope, hope he becomes even better because the U.S. national team will be better for that competition. All right, we have two more. Will we ever see you on the sideline as a coach? Man, oh man. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, 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 people ask me uh, about the, the job that I do right now. Um, I, I believe that if, if you get into broadcasting and you use it as a layover and you're just biding your time for another job to go on and do whatever you feel that you want to do, uh, it will manifest itself in your performance. Uh, in no way have I ever been in broadcasting and said, well, I'm just waiting to want to do something else. I love what I do. It is an absolutely awesome job to be able to talk about soccer, to be able to travel around, to be able to still be within soccer, in some ways to be able to do things on air that make people think, that increase debate. We don't have enough of that when it comes to our sport. We don't talk enough about it. One of the greatest things for me when I'm not on television is to sit in the bar and to talk to people about soccer and to argue about soccer. And to debate, well, this player is better than this player, or this, this era was better than this era. Or why are you doing that? Or why is he doing that? I love that. We don't get enough of that. And we cer don't, certainly don't get enough of it in terms of the media out there. We compare it to other countries, and it's just a constant diet of that. We're getting there. But to be able to at least be a small part of it in what I do right now, I'm very, very fortunate. So as far as being a coach, Maybe, someday, I don't know, but that's not something that I'm thinking about right now. And that question was from Mo Shari 8. Mo Shari? Mo Shari 8, yes. And we'll close with a leadership question. A leadership question from soccer coach Brad. Players apply to be captains, and I conduct interviews. Interesting. What, what do you think about that? I think, that's very, I think that's wonderful. I think that's unique. Um... I think it taps into something in players that is a tool and an asset that may, in the, in the past, in, in this situation, may never have been exposed. Your ability to articulate why you want to be captain or what you would do as captain, I, I think is important. Even the captains and the players that we say, well, they lead by example. Okay, but I still want them to be able to sit down. I'm not talking about in front of people. But I still want them to be able to sit down in front of a coach or in front of a group of players and be able to talk about leadership, and to be able to talk about what drives them and how they see themselves in the context of the team. So I think, I think that would be wonderful. I think it would be fascinating to hear what your players say if given that opportunity. I suspect that you will find out some interesting things that even if the players have been with you for a while, you might not even have known about. I also suspect that you might find some guys who are very, very good at giving interviews. And we've all been around long enough where just because somebody gives a good interview doesn't mean that they know what they're doing. So being able to sort through what is genuine and what is somebody just saying something in order to get the job will be part of the, uh, the coach's task. But I think he and his players probably will be better from the experience. It's interesting. One little bit of housekeeping before we close. For those of you that have spent the evening, 
uh, sitting at your computer. This is one of a number of live stream events that we will have going on this weekend. The next live stream will be tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. It will feature our panel of distinguished guests, Tony Santa, Don Scott, Ian Barker, Bob Gansler, and Tosh Farrell. So that's 7 p.m. tomorrow for a panel entitled, How Far Have We Advanced in Coaching Education and Player Development in the United States? That also will be sponsored by Quick Goal. Thank you all for coming for the first session. And let's give Alexi a good round of applause for this. Thank evening. you very much. Thank you.